Hi, my name's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. This is my January wrap up. In January, I read 13 books. Um, three of them were books that I mentioned on my reading goals videos, books that I wanted to get to in 2022. So that's pretty good going. Um, I've sorted these into some sort of an order. So we're going to start with some classics. Um, first up, a book I read right at the start of the month is Morris by E.M. Forster. This is my first time reading any E.M. Forster um, and I think this is actually probably my favourite read of the month. Um, so Morris, Isabel Morris, um, who we see as he grows up, he starts to become aware of his sexuality. We see him struggling with that. He feels like um, his feelings are somehow unnatural. Um, when he gets a bit older we see him go into some kind of doctor or therapist to try to be cured um, of being gay. Um, when he goes to university he meets another um, young man and we see their relationship develop. Um, this is well known as being um, kind of a happy gay classic. Um, I will say it didn't go the way I was expecting, which I quite enjoyed. This is definitely a book that I will be revisiting in future. It's one that's going to stay with me. Um, I would highly recommend it. It's really well written. There's great characterisation. Um, and it's just a, a really, really lovely book. This was written, I think, in like 1913, 19, 1914, but it wasn't published until the 70s after E.M. Forster's death. Um, I believe because of the subject matter of the book um, but it is one I would definitely highly recommend and I'd be keen actually to read some more E.M. Forster. Next up is The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte and um, this was another book that I wanted to get to in 2022. So this has quite an interesting um, sort of narrative structure so it's framed around um, a young man called Gilbert who is writing a letter to his friend and he's telling his friend about this um, mysterious woman uh, who has come to live in Wildfell Hall with her young child. Um, no one really knows much about her, she's a stranger to the area and he is um, quite entranced by her. So he's, he's writing to his friend telling um, him about this mysterious woman um, and then within the letter we get this other narrative layer of him enclosing I think like diary entries of her and um, Helen um, and so then we go into her from her perspective her telling her backstory and we hear from her before she moved to Wildfell Hall and what led to her um, coming there with her child. For me, I it's a reasonably long book and for me there were a couple of points where my interest kind of waned somewhat, possibly because I'm not a big classics reader um, and maybe I'm just used to pacier books, but I did enjoy it. I did really like the writing and I, and I can see how at the time it probably was quite shocking in subject matter, even though it doesn't seem that way to a modern reader. I believe um, Charlotte Bronte, her sister, didn't want this published um, because it was so controversial. Um, I found, One thing I did find confusing, and it's probably only me that finds this, is there's like three different characters whose name or surname began with a H. And for some reason, I found that quite confusing um, but it's quite possibly only me who, who, would, who would find that. Um, but no, I'm pleased I've read it. It's a good book. Um, probably not one I'd reread in future, but I still enjoyed it. Next up is another book that I wanted to read this year. Um, and this is The Sea, The Sea by Iris Murdoch. So this is my second Iris Murdoch book. I read The Unicorn last year, which I really enjoyed. Um, the Sea, The Sea is an interesting read. I would describe this book as a psychological thriller. Now I've never heard it described like that before but to me, to me that's what this is. So that was quite unexpected when I was reading it. Um, it reminded me of Patricia Highsmith in some ways. Um, sort of like Patricia Highsmith but with more literary 
uh, padding, shall we say. Um, so this is about Charles, who is a pretty unlikable character. Um, and he goes to stay in this like remote farmhouse and his exes just fairly randomly appear um, where he is and we see him sort of reflecting on his previous relationships. Um, it means clear from the start that he is pretty unlikable. Um, he's a fairly unreliable narrator. We can tell that he's got a pretty big viewpoint of himself. Um, we see in particular um, his, his meeting again, one of his exes, who I think is called Hartley, if I've remembered that right, yeah, Hartley, um, and Hartley's current husband, I think, and we see Charles's obsessive behaviours and obsessive thought patterns and paranoia and all of this come out. It's really, really well written. I really like Iris Murdoch's writing. I think for me, I could maybe have done with it being 100 pages shorter, but I think I can see why it does need to be a long book because that's like, that's the essence of the book. It's spending the time with Charles and really getting into his head. I think this is a book that I probably will reread in future and I'm actually really looking forward to reading more by Iris Murdoch. She's written, she wrote like, I don't know, over 25 novels or something. So, um, so yeah, I feel like Iris Murdoch might be like a new favourite author for me, even though I wouldn't say The Sea of the Sea is like necessarily a new favourite book. I do think Iris Murdoch could possibly be a new favourite author so I'm really looking forward to reading more of her work. Next up is Passing by Nella Larson. This I listen to on audio. Um, I very rarely listen to audio books and that's really because I struggle to take information in via audio. Um, but I had a couple of days earlier in the month when I had a really bad headache and I couldn't do anything other than like lay down in a darkened room. So um, on the second afternoon, I decided to try an audio book. Passing was a really short audio book. It was only about three and a half hours long. Um, so Passing follows uh, the story of two women who were friends and one of them has grown up to uh, a married a man and has passed as white um, and then Irene the main character meets Claire who's a friend who's passing as white and they're sort of we see them reintroduced into each other's lives we see the reasons why Claire has chosen to pass as white and her husband's an interesting character he there's a certain scene where he um where irene the main character's gone to their house for tea or something um and jack jack doesn't know that irene who's the friend is actually black she's not passing as white but he just assumes that she is white and we hear his like really really racist views and he has no idea that his wife is black or that the or that Irene is black. So that was a really impactful scene. Um, it is quite a short book. The ending, it, it has a good ending. I like the ending, I will say. Um, I wasn't expecting it. Um, I think this is a book I will revisit in future. I'd probably look to read the physical uh, version in future because I think I'd probably prefer it, reading it in physical form, just because that's my preference. I will say the audiobook that I listened to was really, really very good. It was a very good audiobook, very well um, narrated. So next up is Wide Sogasso Sea by Jean. Reese, this is a tiny little book. Um, I read this because I reread Jane Eyre towards the end of last year, so then I wanted to head to this. This is the imagined backstory of Mr Rochester's first wife. So we see Mr. Rochester's uh, meeting Antoinette, as she's called in here. She comes to be called Bertha because Mr. Rochester called her Bertha when I think they moved to England. But anyway, Mr. Rochester meeting um, Antoinette um, in Jamaica and uh, their relationship developing. And we see up to the point where 
um, they're living in in England and it joins up with the happenings of the novel Jane Eyre. And um, what was interesting in this and what I, what I really wasn't expecting is there are some sections which are actually narrated by Mr Rochester, which I thought was odd. Inter interesting to hear, hear, sort of, hear his narration, but I thought it was a slightly odd choice because this is a really, really short book and this has obviously given a voice to Antoinette. And so I wasn't sure why within this short space of time that we that we get to hear from her why we necessarily needed to hear from Mr Rochester as well if that makes sense I don't know like I guess and like it added to the story I guess but I just thought that was slightly odd I wasn't quite expecting it um but after having reread Jane Eyre recently um yeah it was a, a timely read and one I enjoyed Okay, next up I read The Mercies by Kieran Millwood Hargrave. So this is based on a true story. It's set in the early 17th century in Norway, um, on a Norwegian island of Vardo. And a storm comes and kills all the men who are out fishing. So the women are left on this island to basically sustain themselves to you know, work the land and do every, all the jobs that the men would have done. We see the friendship between Marin and Ursa develop and we see what happens uh, when uh, the people from the mainland, the men from the mainland who are coming to sort of like take over from the women and and there are some stressful parts towards the end in terms of, uh, yeah, how that goes. Um, I think I personally would have maybe liked to have felt a little bit more connected to the characters. I don't know why. I just didn't quite feel as connected as I would have liked to have done. It was really interesting the fact that it was based on a true story, which I didn't know anything about. And that sort of, in some ways, certain aspects of it makes it more stressful, um, shall we say. Um, but no, I'd be interested to read more by Kieran Millwood Hargrave. This is the first book I've read by her, um, and yeah, it's pretty good. Next up, I read Swimming in the Dark by Tomasz Jadrowski. Um, so this is set in 1980s Poland. Um, well, it's framed around our main character, whose name I've forgotten, Ludwig, who is um, in the present day living in America, and he is uh, looking back on his time growing up in Poland. We hear from him from when he's quite a young child, maybe about 10 years old. Um, so we hear from him when he, from when he's quite a young child, when he um, gets a bit older. At one point he goes away to like an agricultural camp and there he meets Janus and their relationship develops from there. Um, we see how that goes when they have to go back to the town and it's set against obviously 1980s Poland so um, the political picture and Janusz and Ludwig have quite different political viewpoints and not just political viewpoints but also in terms of how they have each chosen to um, deal with the political situation um, that they find themselves in and how society is and how they're going to deal with that and they have different understandings I think of, of their own agencies. The novel Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin is referenced throughout this which I have read before and really really liked a lot. Um, there are um, obvious comparisons to be made between the two texts. It's interesting how this is weaved through in terms of the importance that the novel Giovanni's Room has for Ludwig, our main character. He um, acquires a copy as a young boy or somehow because it's not it's, it's not, not a novel that is allowed to be published in, in Poland at that time. So he acquires a novel, a copy somehow, he then lends it to Janus. And they, they themselves, when they are talking about their own relationship and, and where they find themselves and what's going on, um, 
uh, draw comparisons with the plot of Giovanni's Room. So that's quite interesting. You don't have to have read Giovanni's Room before reading this, but if you want to read them both, it probably makes sense to read Giovanni's Room first, and I recommend you do read them both. Um, I really like this. It was quite a quick read. It was compelling. Um, probably a book I would reread in future as well, actually. One of my favourites that I read um, in January, I would say, along with Morris. Okay, next we'll talk about some classic crime. Um, so first up is Castle Skull by John Dixon Carr. Um, so this is set in Germany. Um, in It's a really good set and actually in like an old castle. We're thrown right in at the start where um, there's been two deaths, one in present day, one a little bit in the past but interlinked. And right from the start, there are these two detectives who are not working together for some reason. There's, they're like competing with each other, um, uh, trying to solve the mystery of what's happened. And we have these characters. So because we're thrown into it right at the start, it was kind of difficult for me to um, get a grip on the different characters and who they were. This is quite a sort of like a dark and gothic mystery. It's quite a puzzle box in terms of... Um, mystery element and how that is unpicked um at one point in the book so at the bottom of page 178 it says and i believe this is quite a common thing at the time for mystery books to do this so at this point in the first edition readers were offered a refund from their bookseller for returning the book without having broken the physical seal to reveal the subsequent pages of the novel on the basis that they should now be able to guess the criminal with the clues supplied. So apparently the final section was like somehow covered up or wrapped up. Um, when you get to this point, you should you have all the clues to be able to work out who done it. So if you want, you can take it back with that seal intact to um, the bookshop and get your money back. Um, I did not guess who done it. The reveal was kind of like ridiculous and crazy, but it was kind of it was that kind of book, very sort of theatrical and over the top. Um, I this is not one of my favorite John Dixon cars. I say if you're into this type of book, then it's worth reading just for the like crazy reveal. <laughs> but I can't really see how anyone could have guessed. Um, could have guessed how it unfolds. Um, yeah, the reason I've got a bookmark in is because there's a short story at the end that I still haven't read, so I need to read that. Okay, we're going to stick with some classic crime, and this is short stories. So this is Murder at the Manor, Country House Mysteries. This is part of the British Library Crime Classics collection. Um, so within this collection, there's a number of short story collections. Each one is sort of... Um, themed around a different thing. So this one, they're all set at country houses. Some of them are set on, uh, set abroad or set on different types of transport or involve animals or all different types of things. Um, so yeah, this was a good collection. I really liked it. My two favorite stories were The Mystery of Horned Cops by Anthony Berkeley, which is about a man who one day on his way home, walking across a cops, um, he stumbles on the body of his dead cousin. Um, obviously, in these days, he, there's no mobile phones, so he has to leg it um, home to call the police, and then he says, right, I'll meet you back at the body. He goes back, and the body's disappeared. Um, that was a really good story. And the other one that I particularly liked was An Unlocked Window by Ethel Lena White, who I don't think I've read from before. Um, but this one is about a, a serial killer who is going around killing nurses. Um, it's a very creepy story and it um, they made it into an episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour, which I think I've seen before because it was feeling quite familiar as I read it. Um, but yeah, that was a good read. Okay, finally, in terms of classic crime, um, is Ask a Policeman. This was written by members of the Detection Club. So the T Detection Club was set up in the 1920s by um, crime writers of the day, including Agatha Christie. It still runs to this day. Um, so this book was written in collaboration with a number of those crime writers. They sort of took it in turns to write a chapter each. Um, the, the setting, so we have a... Uh, quite an unlikable character. He's a newspaper tycoon who is murdered in his office in sort of unusual circumstances. 
and what the police do um, as you would is they call in for um, for investigators um, to try to help solve the crime so each of these four investigators has like a chapter and they give their own take on it and they talk they explain how they think this crime was done and who done it so each section is written by a different author but what's interesting is so the four different investigators are investigators from other crime series um but what's interesting is the authors swapped characters so for example there's a chapter told by dorothy l sayers but in her chapter she's writing about the investigator roger sheringham which was invented by anthony berkeley and then anthony berkeley has a section but he's writing about Lord Peter Whimsey, which was obviously created by Dorothy L. Sayers. So you can tell in this book that they they had a, they had a lot of fun, I think, doing this. Um, it is maybe a bit of a case of style over substance in some ways, because I'm not sure how cohesive a novel you're going to get when you've got like six different authors all having a go. Um, but it was an enjoyable read. I didn't know this existed until I saw it in the bookshop. I think it was last year I picked it up. There are um, a few other books in this series where various authors have, have got involved in one way or another in the writing of the book. Um, so if you are a crime aficionado, then I would recommend checking these out. Okay, three books left to go. Next up is a book which I only finished reading last night, as I'm filming this, it's the 1st of February, um, and that is The Wasp Factory by Ian Banks. Hmm. So, so, this is about 16-year-old Frank, who lives on a remote Scottish island with his father. Um... They live a fairly isolated life, but they do like interact within the community and stuff. Um, we know from the start and from the blurb um, that Frank has killed three people. He's murdered three people. Um, as we go through, it's told from it's told in first person from Frank's point of view. As we go through, we find out who he's murdered how that's happened it's a very it's an interesting character portrait of someone who is i mean probably psychopathic i think would probably be uh, the right term um what for me was most disturbing more so than the murders because i read a lot of murders is was the animal cruelty so there is animal cruelty throughout the whole book it's relentless and it is told in a lot of detail as well um and it makes sense in the book because of the the character of of frank but it's just it is a really really disturbing read we find out what the wasp factory is <laughs> and that was very disturbing as well um this book was published in 1984 and I think you can, it's of its time. There are certain aspects of the book which I think as a modern reader are a bit jarring um, and you possibly wouldn't see in a book published nowadays. Um, there is a twist at the end which... I kind of felt a little bit, so what about, I'm not entirely sure, I don't know, I don't really know what to make of it. It was certainly a compelling read, it kept my interest, it was impactful, I think it achieves what it set out to achieve. I think it was written to be a disturbing book and it definitely, it definitely achieves that was it the most disturbing book i've ever read yes i think it was um this is a book that i've wanted to read for a while and i keep thinking no it's going to be too disturbing for me and then so i finally read it i'm glad i've read it i'm not going to reread it 
um, and I wouldn't recommend it unless you really want to read a very, very, very disturbing book. Um, yeah. Okay, next up we've got some translated crime fiction. This is Silent Parade by Keigo Higashino. This was translated from the uh, Japanese by Giles Murray. So this is the fourth book in the series in the Inspector Detective Galileo series, uh, which starts with The Devotion of Suspect X. I haven't read books two and three because my library doesn't have them, but you can read them out of order. Um, so, Silent Parade. Um, we have a young girl who's gone missing. Three years later, her remains have been found. The story revolves around the family of this uh, most recent girl who's remains have been discovered. Uh, it's her mother and father, her sister, friends and so on. Um, and so the crux of it is that this this suspect, this main guy, he basically he just stays silent when he's uh, whenever he's interviewed by the police he just says sat stays silent and he, he 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 can never be charged with anything because they only have circumstantial evidence. Um, so one day there's this big festival, this annual parade that they have in the town and he, while this parade is ongoing, he dies in mysterious circumstances. So um, the police call in Detective Galileo, who's not really called Detective Galileo, that's his nickname. He is a professor of physics and occasional unofficial consultant to the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department. So we follow Detective Galileo as he speaks to the people involved, and tries to work out what's happened, how this guy was murdered, who did it and why. Um, it is quite convoluted. Um, it's a real sort of puzzle box of a book. It gets into a lot of detail about the, the details of like the murder, how things were done and the intricacies of that. Um, I like that it, refer it does reference throughout some classic crime fiction, so like the first part there's a quote from John Dixon Carr. Second part, there's a quote from Arthur Conan Doyle. Third part, there's a quote from Agatha Christie. Um, I think the resolve is quite interesting, quite satisfying. Overall, this is not my favourite Higashino book, so I wouldn't say it's necessarily a good place to start. I mean, you can start with it because, you know, you can read them out of order. Um, but for me, I'd recommend either reading the first book in this series, which is The Devotion of Suspect X, or the first book in another of his series, which is called Malice. They would be, I think, better places to start. And the final book that I read was 56 Days by Catherine Ryan Howard. This has got a bookmark in it, but I have read it. I don't know why. Um, so yeah, so this is a psychological thriller. This is um, this author's most recent book. I think it was published last year. Uh, I have read one other book by this author called The Nothing Man, which was also excellent. So 56 Days is set in the pandemic, in the COVID pandemic. We The book opens um, in early March 2020. It's set in Dublin. And our two main characters, Oliver and Kira, bump into each other in a supermarket randomly. They start talking and then they start dating. Um, a couple of weeks later, Ireland goes into lockdown for the first time and they realise that they're not going to be able to see each other. So they decide to move in together for the duration of lockdown. Um, the 56 days is... The 56 days is 56 days from when they meet to when the police find a dead body in an apartment block. Um, so the chapters are told from, some of them are told from the police's point of view in the present day. Um, some of them are, and then the others are interspersed between being told by Kira and being told by Oliver. And we, uh, they're told, the timing jumps around a little bit, so it might be like, I don't know, 21 days, 33 days, whatever. Um, it's quite clear from the start that both of them have something to hide, um, but we don't know what. It's a really compelling read. It's a really 
um, it's very much a page turner. I found the same with The Nothing Man, which um, I read last year. There are some quite dark aspects to this book, um, which made for quite uncomfortable reading. Um, the uh, There was a certain point where, as things were becoming revealed, um, I had one of those moments where the author wrong-footed me. I thought I knew where it was going and what was happening, and I didn't, um, uh, which was very satisfying. I love those moments. Um, it was a really uh, like solid book. I think it's interesting. I've enjoyed. I've read a few sort of books set in the pandemic, and I think it's interesting from a couple of points of view. It's interesting in terms of reading about reflections on the pandemic and thinking about the experience that we've all been through and are all still going through. <clears throat> but the other side of it, I think, is interesting is that sort of like lockdown provides quite a, a unique setting for this sort of like thriller novel. Um, so if you are looking for just a good, solid, pacey psychological thriller, um, I think this is a great one to go for. So those are all the books that I read in January. Let me know if you've read any of them, what you thought of them. I just kicked the camera. Let me know what your favourite book was that you read in January. I hope you're all doing well and I will speak to you all again very soon. Bye.